Oh, the pattern in my lectures uh, for this series and workshop is pretty much saying how economics is done, how it should be done. We're back to looking at how it is done, not how it should be done. And if you look at neoclassical micro, and I think this is one of the reasons why neoclassical theory is so strongly believed by its fans, is that it, it looks so simple and persuasive. Uh, you get the argument, and you read this so often, prices are set by supply and demand. So the drawing, and I emphasise this is a drawing, it is not real data, shows demand falling as prices rise, supply uh, rising as prices rise, but you have to pay a higher price to get uh, the output. And there's an equilibrium where the level demanded is equal to the level supplied, and that's the ideal situation for the market. And this is taken from Samuelson and Nordhaus's textbook. Now, the drawing is great, but how do you derive them? How do you actually say, this is what causes the supply curve and this is what causes the demand curve? I'll we'll start with the supply curve, and that's seen as being upward sloping. Now, what that's saying is, suppliers demand a higher price if they're going to be asked to supply a higher quantity. And the logic is that they face what's called diminishing marginal productivity, and this will be put across as the law in so many textbooks. Uh, and they have a downward sloping demand curve and another law, this is called diminishing marginal utility. And the intersection of the two maximises social welfare because since these are both marginal curves, they're the slopes of total curves and the slope of the demand curve gives you total utility and the slope of the supply curve gives you total cost and where the slopes are the same, the gap between the two is biggest. So this is where you maximise social welfare. That's the whole idea of neoclassical economic theory. And here's another drawing, again with made-up data by Samuelson and Nordhaus, showing that the competitive equilibrium point. This point only applies if markets are competitive. And by competitive, they mean that individual suppliers can supply as much as they like at the market price. Any, anything they add to supply does not change the market price. Well, let's take a look at the empirical data on production and consumption and see how well the, see the theory stacks up against the empirical data. <clears throat> so the theory is that the supply curve is the sum of the marginal cost curves of individual firms in a given industry. And marginal cost for each firm rises because each firm faces diminishing marginal productivity, meaning that each additional unit they produce, each additional worker they add to production rather, generates a falling level of output per worker. And this is called the law, the law of diminishing returns. The firm will get less and less extra output when it adds additional units of an input while holding all other inputs fixed. And this is, a, again, another made-up example in a textbook. You have a linear increase in the number of units you have a steeply rising number of labour units needed to produce those units of out your output of wheat, and therefore the total cost rises sharply as you add more and more workers. Now, the next stage of this, of the um, set of drawings in Nord Samuelson and Nordhaus shows for a while you have rising marginal productivity and then falling marginal productivity, and you then invert the curve and you find rising marginal costs. If you imagine taking that curve and twisting it around, flipping the axes of the graph, that's what gives you that rising marginal cost curve. And marginal cost above average cost is the amount the firm will supply to the marketplace. And the logic here critically depends upon the assumption that the amount that a firm can sell is does not affect the market price. So the demand curve shown here are horizontal lines. Now, what that means is the increase in revenue from going from 3,000 units for this firm to 4,000 units for this firm is the market price, which does not change, times 1,000. And you get a horizontal line coming out here, and therefore marginal revenue is exactly the same as market price. So when marginal revenue equals marginal cost, the firm maximises its profits for that level of, uh, of demand. And these are three different levels of demand, a level where the firm is doesn't get enough to cover its average cost, another where demand is higher, so it gets to cover, just cover its average costs. And here, its costs are 
uh, a well, its marginal cost are well above its average cost. It therefore makes additional revenue, and that's a point of ma major profit. So if this, uh, if and only if marginal revenue equals price, then the point where profit is maximised is identified by the marginal cost curve. So the supply curve for the firm is the marginal cost curve. That's essential <clears throat> to the theory of the firm. And then to get the market demand curve, you simply add up horizontally the marginal cost curve of every firm in the industry. So again, this is taken from Nordhaus and Samuelson. And you simply add these marginal cost curves horizontally, you get the market supply curve. Okay, now those emphasise, those are all made up examples. They're not derived from going and asking various firms in an industry, even various wheat firms, which might be close to something you might argue is perfectly competitive. Uh, they're made up by the textbook author. Now, in the 1990s, Alan Blinder decided to ask real firms what their actual cost structures were. And this is the book that was produced as a result of the, the surveys that he undertook. And the reason he did the survey is that a defining difference between two sects of the mainstream, being what are called the New Classical and the New Keynesian, is the New Classicals believe that price adjustments take care of everything. So the market, from the New Classical point of view, whatever market you're looking at, is always in equilibrium, including, for example, the labour market during the Great Depression. New Keynesians were at least realistic enough, to, enough, enough not to swallow that particular idea, so they said, well, there must be something meaning the market doesn't reach equilibrium fast enough by price adjustments. So prices have to be sticky in some sense, and that's essential to the new Keynesian view. So Blinder, who's one of the new Keynesians, decided to ask with a survey, why do firms have sticky prices? Now, Blinder is, is about as close to neoclassical royalty as you can get. He was once a vice chair of the Federal Reserve. He was once a vice president of the American Economic Association. So he's straight mainstream, but I must give him credit, he actually did undertake this survey, and that's better than most mainstreamers. Now, so this is the book published as a result of the work, and in doing it, he, I mean, I'd love to get a research grant as big as Alan Blinder got. He got a research grant that enabled him to hire PhD students to go and interview 200 firms face to face. And when he looked at how much of American output those 200 firms produced, it was equivalent to 7.6% of the output of the non-farm sector of the American economy. That is a huge survey, far beyond what you need to be making statistical derivations from a sample to the overall population. So you really can't deny the results of this survey. Now, one of the many questions that the survey asked is, what is the shape of the firm's marginal cost curve? And of course, what he was expecting to get was a rising marginal cost curve. Now, he summarised the findings of his survey in a truly dreadful diagram. I've never seen anything this bad in any major book at all. But here is the drawing from figure 4.1 of his book. And, you know, if you did those with the, pen, with the pencil, I'd be, I'd be amazed. So page 103 of, of um, asking about prices. Now, what he's saying there is that most firms report not rising marginal costs, which is what the theory tells students is the real world, but falling marginal costs. So 32.6% said they had declining marginal costs, and another 8% said declining marginal costs with spikes. 40% said constant marginal costs, and another 8% said constant marginal costs with spikes. Only 11.1% said they faced rising marginal cost. And the way Blinder described this in his book was the overwhelmingly bad news here, brackets for economic theory, is that only 11% of GDP is produced under conditions of rising marginal cost, which the textbook teaches being the case for everybody, the simplifying assumption. Almost half is, has constant marginal cost, 40% report falling marginal costs, and most firms have very high fixed costs, roughly 40% of total costs. Again, that's very different to what the textbooks teach, and many more companies have to have falling rather than rising marginal cost curves and he said whether they understood the questions or not, their answers paint an image of the cost structure of the typical firm that is very different from the one immortalised in textbooks. Spot on. Okay. This is what this is real world stuff. This should have changed economic theory completely. Now, in theory, why do you get rising marginal cost? 
It's again because you have fixed, unit, fixed inputs, machines, and a variable number of workers. And here's Samuelson and Nordhaus again. So they say, assume that we are holding land, machinery, and all other inputs constant. That's not a problem. What they also assume, though, is that you use every last unit rather than using units in a perfect ratio. So you're assuming that you're using all your machines at once. 100% of the machines are turned on, but a lot of them are being used at below the ideal ratio of workers to machines. There is an ideal worker to machine ratio, and productivity will rise until you reach that ideal ratio. But beyond that point, you'll have diminishing marginal productivity. That's the basic theory. Now, what that gives you, and you can actually see this in the textbooks themselves, is a vision of a typical firm being one of managerial and engineering chaos. So this is from Mancure. And what he points, paints as the picture of the typical firm is somewhere that's overcrowded, chaotic, and badly organised. So Thirsty Thelmas, now you've all shopped at Thirsty Thelmas, haven't you? It's another made-up example. Rising marginal costs as the output rises. And this is diminishing marginal product once more. So you have a, when you're producing a small quantity, very few workers, much of the equipment not being used. What he means is it's all being used, but very inefficiently. Then as you add uh, more and more workers, you get rising marginal productivity for a while. But when you get to a high level of output, and that's what they seem is applying with all firms, her stand is crowded with workers and most of her equipment is fully utilised. She can produce more lemonade by adding more workers, but these new workers have to work in crowded conditions and may have to wait to use the equipment. Oh, it's a tough life. So therefore, when the quantity being produced is already high, the marginal product of an extra worker is low and the marginal cost of an additional glass, glass of lemonade is high. That's the standard theory. Now, let's get real. In the real world, and I'll explain why in a moment, most firms deliberately have excess capacity. They operate the machines at an ideal ratio of workers to machines. In fact, I'll give you a little anecdote. I, I bumped into a production manager in a uh, airport one day, and he was off to China. The reason being that his firm produced a machine which needed eight workers per machine and produced, I think it was something like 14 million units of, uh, of RFID chips per year with that ratio. China was using 16 workers per machine and producing 8 million chips per year. You want to know what the hell's going on, that they were using the machines in the wrong ratio. That's the real world. But this, is, and this makes a huge difference to the shape of the cost curves of different firms. So if firms have less um, demand than they need, and therefore they're firing, hiring less workers than are necessary to use all the machines in their factory, they will use those machines idle. They won't even turn them on. They will turn those new machines on or turn those lines on when employment rises and the productivity of the entire factory will rise as utilisation approaches 100%. And then as you start to reach that point, you'll build a new factory before you reach full capacity. That will be technologically advanced compared to your current factory. So your cost will tend to fall. Now, this is a, a gift from one of Tesla's factories. I don't think I can see a single worker in there. But there's no way that looks... That's not chaos. That is highly organised manufacturing. And why do they have... Why do firms start with excess capacity? Well, simply because growth has been the normal situation for capitalism. All firms expect to be growing in a growing industry. Therefore, when you build a factory, it must be larger than existing demand. If you build a factory and it was only big enough for your current demand, so it was 100% uh, utilised on day one when it was opened, you've got to build another factory. Okay? So the sensible thing is to build factories larger than is necessary for existing demand. If all you're all doing it, you've all got more capacity than is necessary for the industry. Otherwise, firms couldn't grow. Now, competition also drives firms to try to produce more than their existing share of output. If you are Toyota, let's say, and you've got 30% of the car market, you want to grow to 35%. Ford might have 30%, wants to grow to 35%. Chrysler, etc., etc. So the desire to be competitively successful means the sum of capacity in the industry is greater than existing demand. Now, therefore, 
you're all going to be struggling to get as much of the demand as you can. And how do you do it? You don't compete on price, you compete on quality and features. And a successful firm, if its car is different in various qualitative ways that are superior to the other for car, for car manufacturers, then you will get higher capacity utilisation. Because of that higher capacity utilisation, you will get lower costs. And therefore, the lower costs and higher capacity, you make more profits, you grow more than your rivals. The unsuccessful ones get lower capacity and higher costs, so they tend to drop out of the industry. So what you get out of that is large firms. That's the norm in capitalist economies, not the, the myth of perfect competition, but large firms dominating an industry and lots of small firms below them trying to grow to take over their scale. Now, Blinder simply rediscovered what had been found by a range of economists before them, most of them became what we now call post-Keynesian economists, because when they saw the empirical data, they took it seriously, they couldn't continue being neoclassical economists. So Hall and Hitch before the Second World War, Lester in 46, Eitman in 47, and Fred Lee does a wonderful survey in his book, Post-Keynesian Pricing Theory. So that's the real world. That's what actually exists out there. Now, why do economic textbooks not teach the real world? Why do they teach a fantasy instead? Well, it's because if you teach the real world, the neoclassical theory of a rising supply curve collapses because marginal cost can't be the supply curve for each individual firm. If they have marginal cost which is falling, then variable cost is above marginal costs, and average total cost, which includes fixed costs, are far above again. Any firm that priced at marginal cost would be losing money hand over fist. They'd rapidly go bankrupt. But prices being equal to marginal cost is vital to neoclassical micro theory that talks about maximising that gap between total cost and total benefit and total cost. So they, it's an integral to the micro, macro theory as well these days. So they just don't want to accept what the real world tells them. But the real world shows that the only way firms can make a profit is to have cost plus pricing. They work out their total costs, they put a markup above that, and they compete to get as much of the market as they can at that markup level. That's what it, real costs will look like. So what you have is high fixed costs and low and declining marginal costs. And this is a, a toy, again, a toy example, but a bit closer to reality talking about the production inside a silicon wafer firm. So you have extremely high fixed costs, therefore fixed costs per unit fall in a rectangular hyperbola. You have declining variable costs, so marginal costs are way down here. The only way you can make a profit is if you price above average cost per unit. If you priced at marginal cost, you'd lose that much per unit. You'd be bankrupt in no time at all. So the neoclassical theories teachers prefer their theory to reality. And one of the, the, the crazy signs of this for me was that I went to looking at the Amazon and said, how many people have read Blinder's book, which is empirically based, versus how many have read Mas Kalel's theoretical textbook on neoclassical micro? And here's the number of surveys, one survey of asking about prices versus 74 of Maskell's microeconomic theory. Now, a little quiz for you. Who do you reckon wrote the survey? Wrote the, uh, wrote the five star rating for Alan Blinder? I'm not quite the only person who's read the book. Okay? But the mainstream simply ignores stuff they don't want to know about the real world. Now, what I found, I just realised this just recently. Alan Blinder writes a textbook. Does he use his own empirical research in that textbook? The answer is no. In his textbook, he continues to teach diminishing marginal productivity. So he draws a graph like this showing marginal cost falling and then rising over time. Standard stuff. And he then argues that the law of diminishing returns was actually empirically discovered he literally says this, the so-called law rests simply upon observed facts. Economists did not produce the result analytically. That, pardon me, I'm going to be Australian here, that's bullshit. Okay? It's a theoretical deduction on the assumption of fixed in inputs with variable inputs being used 
below and then above an ideal ratio. And the opposite is true. Empirical research, which Blinder himself did, found the opposite, that marginal cost falls with output. So what they teach in textbooks is a logical deduction from false premises, and so much of neoclassical theory is like that. It's been contradicted by observation, in this case, even by Blinder. So all the models you see in textbooks are fairy stories. The numbers are made up by the authors to fit with neoclassical theory. And even then, the what I call fractured fairy tales, if you don't know what I mean, but if you're too young to know what a fractured fairy tale is, click on the link and you go see some fabulous cartoons from the 1960s. Okay. Now, Mankiw has Carolyn, he loves alliteration, Thirsty Thelmas, Carolyn's Cookies, etc., etc. So this is an example of his textbook on page 271. So there he has the number of workers, the output in terms of cookies per hour being produced, the marginal product which falls all the way through, the cost being constant, that's like, like the amortised cost. You, you paid for a factory, you've got to pay the interest rate cost, so that's where the cost comes from. Cost per worker and the total cost of inputs being the sum of the whole lot. Now, this leads to the following data on marginal and average costs and average fixed costs. You won't find this in MANQ. Notice the marginal uh, cost is rising over here, getting higher. Marginal revenue is constant, profit negative to positive, and maximised at 140 units. And the number is important. So, I'm going to graph that. Now, if you've ever studied economics, that is a shitty looking graph. Okay? Marginal cost rising way out here, average variable cost, only, only total cost rising very slowly. It's ugly. And why does it look like this? You know, this is the sort of graph you want to see. Steeply rising marginal cost, cutting through at almost the minimum of average variable costs, halfway out on the diagram. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. You only get beautiful drawings like that if you have either no numbers, and notice there are no numbers on this chart whatsoever from Varian, or low numbers. Now, why is that? Well, average variable cost is something like a quadratic. You have terms in Q squared. Average fixed cost is an inverse function. It's a rectangular hyperbola. You have fixed costs, so let's say the cost for a, a typical semiconductor fabrication factory, $2 billion, divided by the quantity of chips produced per year that will fall at a rectangular hyperbola as you increase output. So that's fixed, fixed cost divided by quantity, 1 over Q versus Q squared. Now, only for small values of Q will 1 over Q be proportional to Q squared, and it'll look like they think they should on, on a diagram. So what you get out of this is actually crazy compromises. And my favourite one here is Hungry Helens versus Thirsty Thelmas in Mancu's book, which have two totally different drawings for total costs. Now, he uses thirsty thelmas to get his average and variable and marginal cost curves. OK, so there's, but that's hungry Helens, there's thirsty thelmas. Notice the numbers on the axis for thirsty thelmas are small, 1 to 10. The numbers on hungry Helens are relatively large, 0 to 150. Big numbers versus small numbers. Why is that? Well, if you use the small numbers and thirsty thelmas, there's your total cost curve with small numbers and so on. And you can then derive a marginal cost curve and an average total cost and average fixed costs, which look like the way neoclassical economists think their costs are. Okay. But if you try to do that with hungry Helens, you get an ugly curve. So he uses one to talk about, what's he, uh, I can't see actually on the title what he actually worked about there. But you try it, you take the numbers like take reasonable numbers for quantity per year produced by some factory and draw what you get. And you get curves that are ugly, like that first one I showed there. So why, why do they resist the real world? Why do they not want to include in their textbooks what real world data tells them is the actual cost structure of firms? It's because the marginal cost and the marginal revenue curves are the slopes of the total cost and total benefit curves. When they're equal, the gap is maximum, and that's what they want to show. Capitalism, perfect, perfect uh, free enterprise, perfect competition capitalism maximises utility given the costs of generating that utility. It's an ideological thing. Whether they realise they're being 
ideological or not. Now, if that doesn't work, if there isn't, if total cost is actually, if marginal cost is falling, then you can't determine output by comparing marginal cost and marginal revenue. There's no optimal output level. So the market isn't working out the optimal output level because no such thing actually exists for each individual firm. So a major ideological justification that neoclassical economics gives for competitive market capitalism fails in the real world. And rather than accepting that that is wrong, they prefer to ignore the real world. And blind me is, is the classic example. I have to say that I'm not singling him out for, for brutal comparison here. At least he went out and checked and saw what the real world was like. And Marx, as I explained in my critiques of Marx, when he was confronted with a clash between his philosophy and his belief in socialism, went for the belief in socialism rather than his philosophy. So this is a common problem in, in humanity. You don't want to have your religion contradicted by the real world. But what they, so it's consequently, they ignore the real world. They, they think they're modeling it. Most of them haven't read Alan Blinder, haven't read Eidman. Don't even look at the real world data. Simply they make up mathematical uh, models that fit their beliefs. And the main one they like is the, called the Cobb-Douglas production function. And I might just save that for the, um, the next lecture. The next stage I'm going to go to is showing you how to take the godly table, maybe a simple one of the one I, I showed in the previous workshop, take that and turn it into a model of a monetary economy. Back shortly. <laughs>